I'd like to um, introduce our next session, which is about boardroom buy-in. And I guess if uh, if we as comms professionals are Captain Kirk or Captain Janeway, the board is often our final frontier um, for getting great things out into the world or actually all containing a crisis. Um, but as all comms people know, stakeholder management is actually a skill in itself. And we also know that while the reputation of a business is its most valuable asset, sometimes getting a, a comms a voice at the table doesn't always reflect that value. I think certainly the news and certainly the news that Martin referenced earlier around um, the PNO crisis um, certainly um, echoes that. So to talk about this, I am joined by two powerhouses in senior comms. Um, Dr. Lashonda Eady, who is Assistant Professor of Public Relations at Penn State University and a member of the Public Relations Society of America 40 Under 40 in Dallas. Lovely to see you, Lashonda. And also Christina Massina, who is Corporate Affairs Director at Nestle, um, which I uh, am reliably informed now is the largest food and beverage company in the world. Ladies, welcome to both of you. Thank you for having us, Rose. Thank you. Lovely. And good that our, our sound is working. That was a great way. That was a great way to test it. Um, <laughs> Christina, I'd like to start with you. Um, you and your role, uh, you're trying to connect different parts of the business There's a, to get a clear narrative, and there are very different parts of the business. Um, within that kind of context, is the board um, the, the worst or the least of your worries? Is, is, that, is that always your main focus, or do you have to be balancing that with everything else that you need to think about? So hello, everyone. And uh, as I said before, I think it's a, it's a great pleasure to join you today. Uh, if I come to your question, Rose, the most exciting part of my role and the part that I enjoy the most is actually connecting the wider organization. So, you know, the I think we're very privileged, privileged as communication professional to have a very holistic view, you know, to be uh, connected with every single part of the business. Nonetheless, when it comes to the board, it is absolutely crucial to have buy-in and to be more connected to them because when it comes to influencing, when it comes to um, you know, building and co-creating the long-term strategy of the organization, but also, you know, getting the resources, getting the right support, it is absolutely critical to be, uh, you know, very close to them, a trusted partner, uh, you know, a valuable and wise advisor to the board. And I, and I know that that is, uh, is something that you, you don't get to earn overnight. Um, and Lashonda, you, you told me when we spoke earlier this week that, you know, your students are lucky to be able to, to role play real life before it happens. But you need to find your voice, I guess, in order to, to make that connection, particularly with senior stakeholders. What kind of advice do you, do you give them for doing that? Well, firstly, I'm so happy to be here today and I've loved all of the sessions before this one. And I think that there has been, uh, or there have been several common threads and one of them is authenticity, even if the exact term wasn't used. And so um, when I talk to students about that, firstly, I emphasize the importance of honing those skills and developing those skills that are probably sometimes described as more hard skills that might not necessarily be associated um, with our discipline and industry, um, you know, that might be more closely associated with business because at the end of the day, when they get in the workplace, you know, even as entry level professionals, if they can demonstrate their expertise and their knowledge of the businesses or the organization's bottom line, that will help them go a long ways as well. And then, of course, the, the most important thing as far as their voice is concerned is that they need to be authentically them and understand what their ethical compass is, uh, moral compass and why they do what they do so that when they are and uh, in the workplace, and when those moments do happen, they can take advantage of it. That's that's a, a really good point. And I, I mean, we were talking earlier about uh, purpose and that authenticity and that authentic voice is something that is um, is absolutely vital if you've got if you're to keep your own compass um, afloat, going through going through all the various things that you need to do in order to engage. Um, and I guess also there's that. There's that point about um, the kind of skills that you need to learn. And um, I, I always thought the best mentoring advice I got was always make sure you understand a spreadsheet as well as understand as well as understand comms. 
Um, and that kind of leads to my, my next question, which is about this. Um, it's often really been said that stakeholder management is about art and science. Yeah, it's, it's uh, when it comes to gaining support, um, is it always about the numbers or is the storytelling key? Um, and then, of course, there's that measurement piece. How do you get PR is often the, the hardest part of the um, equation to measure. So how on earth do you do you go about measuring reputation? Yeah, I think it's a brilliant question. And I love the definition of stakeholder management as an art and a science. I totally agree with that definition. I think, uh, you know, when it comes to what component of that mix are important, I think both are because, uh, you know, the storytelling is very powerful. But when you think about, uh, you know, I, I, I think about my stakeholders, the majority of the stakeholders I have as a board counterpart, they are kind of very rational, number-driven uh, business people. So, you know, I think the right balance and combining the powerful story with fact-driven um, measurement is absolutely paramount. And I think, you know, there is also an element of knowing your stakeholders, stakeholders and getting to create those trusted, uh, driven relationship that is very important because I think it is also critical to adapt your narrative and your way of influencing in a way that really resonates with those stakeholders. Um, in general terms, in my personal experience, I've um, evolved because probably, you know, the power of storytelling is something that is more common for a communication professional. In the last years, I've worked with my team more on the element of measuring, numbering, you know, identifying very powerful key performance indicator when it comes to reputation and really fo focusing our attention, not too much on the process, but more on the impact. I think LaShonda was mentioning before, you know, the impact that you have on the bottom line, I think is absolutely cr crucial and critical. So if I can offer, you know, some of the things that we have started to measure more systematically uh, in the last uh, couple of years, and even even longer in reality, we have really uh, focused on quantifying the impact of our activities and in particular in how those activities drive increased trust, how they increase, incre in, drive inc increased favorability and ultimately also advocacy. You know, we are a we are a product, uh, a product and brand company. So the advocacy piece uh, is, is ultimately very important. So I've seen a shift uh, and I've seen, you know, I've observed, resonate, I've observed resonating those key elements and so those key indicator in a much more powerful way with certain um, of my colleagues, in fact, uh, in the board that are, as I said, more um, number-driven, uh, fact-based, decision-maker, et cetera. And I think that uh, getting to know those personalities and kind of reading the room, that's something I know that, that you've mentioned as well, um, LaShonda. We should be good at that, right? We're comms professionals. <laughs> right. And, and, I, and we heard some of that as well this morning about knowing the room, but just in a different context, you know, for external messaging and, you know, seeing if what you plan to say resonates with those external stakeholders but i think the same applies internally and the only way that you can really know uh those people around the table is to be building those relationships um as an ongoing process and so it can't be kind of a fly by night thing it has to be you know effort and work and time put into it and at the same time um, demonstrating your credibility and your expertise so that when the time comes that you do need to uh, perhaps make a recommendation that might not be, I guess, as popular or people just might not be rallying behind it, then because you've been doing that ongoing relationship building and you do know who's in the room, you can articulate it in a way that resonates with the various people around that table, but also you can have the surety that they are also going to accept what you're saying um, and that they view you as an expert. And I guess we're now coming back into a situation where we're in a in a hybrid world. So we're we're seeing people face to face um, as well as communicating online. But I guess throughout COVID, the, the building those, how easy has it been to to build and maintain those relationships? Um, Christina, what, what was what was your journey like there? Yeah, I have to say, for me, it was quite of a challenge at first because I I was in the global headquarter in Switzerland. Uh, 
and I just literally had moved here in the UK into my new role uh, in mid-January when the pandemic hit. So I really didn't have uh, that much of time, you know, for building normal relationship in in uh, in that situation with, you know, even with my team and with my colleagues, obviously, and and with the board colleagues. So. Um, you know, I just had to adapt and, and be flexible, as flexible as, as I possibly can. But I had to invest quite a lot of time and even more energy, in, in all honesty, to try and build those relationships. So I had to be um, the one that was looking to reach out more and more, the one that was, you know, provoking the conversation more and more. Uh, so, you know, really being intentional in terms of uh, sharing more updates, having those one-to-one -one conversation that, you know, in a normal situation would have happened normally, just at the coffee machine or having lunch together or whatever you name it. But I, I think I made uh, the conscious decision to really invest a lot more energy in creating and getting to understand my stakeholders. Um, that's, I think, where the science beat <laughs> Yeah. comes into play that we're referring to because uh, you know the intentionality uh, needed in this kind of situation is is significant i think that's right and it's interesting lashonda to think about the next generation of comms professionals um many of whom have kind of learned their craft as we've come through um online do, do you see any um stones in the road ahead um I, I don't think so. I agree with Christina that it definitely can be much more draining to have to try to um, kind of facilitate those types of interactions online in the workplace. As a professor with students, it's much harder as well. And, you know, I could feel like I've been teaching for a day when I've only been in there for an hour, depending on what feedback and engagement I'm, I'm getting. But I also think that, or, or usually, I try to also look for the positives in things that you know may seem um, mostly negative. And I do think that there is um, an opportunity also um, through the 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 more prevalent use of these online platforms to be able to connect with more people. Um, and, you know, cross geographical boundaries and others in ways that we might not have been able to do as easily. So I really do think, like Christina said, being intentional is very important, but also being strategic. And so although it might not be the ideal way to do it, look for what things you can actually accomplish through this way that might not be um, what what you would prefer to do. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that idea. I just want to also just think then about the kind of um, the ambition, um, the kind of long term ambition that always excites us um, uh, in terms of comms versus the short term targets or even, you know, the the short term crises that bowl in and take us off, take us off course. Um, and, you know, there's been you know, a fair few things happening in the world that have contributed to <clears throat> that short termism um, or that need to be short term or perhaps knee jerk. Um, but how do you navigate? How as how as comms professionals can you can you navigate through that um, and keep that balance right? Um, Lashonda, what are your thoughts here? Well, firstly, assuming that you are or that you do as the comm leader have a seat at the table, then you should be able to have those conversations um, with your colleagues in the boardroom uh, to say, you know, yes, this does seem like. Uh, an immediate or imminent threat. And this is my assessment of it and why I think either A, we do need to, you know, um, dedicate resources to this in the short term or B, these are the reasons that we don't. And I think that um, it's good to uh, think about both the, the immediate and the long term as well, because you really can't be solely focused on either because it can be very dangerous. And so I think um, making sure that there's kind of this constant conversation of thinking about the uh, or weighing the the pros and cons and balancing, um, you know, what considerations are on the table in the short term and the long term is really kind of what needs to happen. And so there's that element of, of proactivity, but I guess you can't always be proactive, can you, Christina? 
No, and uh, I mean, those are really difficult time for leaders to navigate, I have to say. And uh, I think many of us have gone through crisis. I know, Lashonda, you're an expert in, in debt, but many of us have gone through crisis in the past. I think what is really different now is on one side, uh, you know, the length, the, inten the intensity of the crisis, but also, frankly, the unpredictability of how long it's going to last and of the future, to be honest. So I think what I see once again with my stakeholders and with my leaders is that when a crisis hits, there is a uh, you know, I think there is an immediate response and therefore, you know, there is quite immediately a, a desire and a need to act and to have, act decisive, decisiveness, with decisiveness. I think, um, you know, sometimes the challenge that we have is exactly what you said, Lashonda, it's reminding ourselves, even, you know, us as communication professionals that want to fix everything and immediately, it's just to remind ourselves that, you know, at the end of the day, we are here for the long run, at least in my case, you know, in, in the case of a company like the one I work for that has been around for more than 150 years, it's about doing the right thing now, but also projecting yourself for the future and for the long term is not uh, a balance that is very easy uh, to uh, strike all the time. But I think, uh, you know, it is important that we try to detach ourselves and look at our, look at uh, the situation with more objectivity, thinking about, OK, how do I solve the issue today? But how do I preserve the business, the reputation, my way of communicating my values, my purpose for the long term? And, and I also do think that um, at the same time, there's kind of an education that we as comms people also um, have to do with our counterparts that may not understand the landscape the same. And so it's <coughs> in the crisis context, you know, just because X number of users are mad on a platform about maybe a problem with the app. That doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, we're going to open up the war room and that we have to go into full crisis mode, because really what we need to do is stop first and see what actually is the issue that's being raised. And oftentimes that could be, um, you know, an operational issue or a customer service issue. And so I think that as communicators, we have a really unique role in helping the organization really focus in and hone in on what the issue is. And also sometimes, you know, helping there not be an alarm about something that's not necessary, but also emphasizing the fact that in those types of cases, if it isn't handled appropriately, then yes, it can actually um, escalate into a crisis where we will be going um, in the war room. And so I think that having those conversations in and out of crisis, especially outside of it, is really helpful as well so that when it happens, then everybody can feel that much more confident and comfortable knowing that, well, you know, let's take a step back and see what we really are dealing with here. And I think social media amplifies that so much more that if you're not savvy and knowledgeable, you will see that and say, oh, my gosh, you know, the building's on fire. But really, no, it's not. What a brilliant point, Lashonda, is absolutely critical what you said I think sometimes we also have it's true sometimes I think we play the role of accelerator in a way to say okay this is what can happen please let's let's act decide with with uh, you know quite bold action but on the other side a lot of the time we have to really play that role of mirror and saying okay it looks like the house is on fire, as you rightly described it. But in reality, let's put this into perspective. You know, it might be uh, maybe a social media post that is getting some traction. It might be a, a, a press article that is putting pressure, pressure on us as an organization or as leaders, but maybe the broader context is different. So that ability to uh, put things into perspective, I think is also very, very crucial. I think that's, that's so true and it's, um... It's also just to guard against um, when things are flaring up and, and the virtue signaling, I think Anna was mentioning this earlier, versus the thoughtfulness about how, how you respond. Um, you know, we were talking um, earlier, Lashondra, about 
Black Lives Matter and everyone rushing to put the, the black square on Instagram versus thinking through what they were really doing as an organization and taking that time to, um, to be thoughtful. Um, and uh, I, I think also just th thinking about the news, and I know this is something that's happened um, in, uh, in Europe very recently, we've referred a couple of times today to the reputational damage to P&O ferries through the decision to um, make 800 members of staff redundant with no prior warning. I'd just like to, to ask both of you and maybe just kick off with Christina, how, what are your thoughts on, on what happened and how, how the comms could have been thought through and, and, and planned in a way that would have been thoughtful? Look, I, I don't know what has been the deci decision making process, obviously. I've read like everyone else, uh, you know, the whole debate and the impact. But I wondered whether typically in a case like that, communication was not considered as a strategic element of, uh, you know, in, in decision making or whether you know the communication person the communication head of pno at that point in time was just put in front of the actual uh, decision that had already taken place because uh, or even if the, the 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 risk was highlighted but ignored i honestly i honestly don't know but uh, it's clear that um, you know i wouldn't have a uh, I really wouldn't wouldn't like to be in that position um, as a as a communication as a communication person because, uh, as I said, it's quite a challenging situation. And for me, is a is a typical situation. I know that there is a debate on whether or not it was legal to do what they have done, but I, it's the typical situation where reputation and law are not on the same level. You know, I think sometimes. I think Lashonda, you were talking about that before, you know, following your moral compass, doing the right thing, what is right, should be, uh, you know, being authentic and being respectful of, you know, your organization or your people should be the, the, the guiding principle and, uh, and, and the solution. And obviously um, has not been uh, what we have seen. Um, I don't know if you have more insights, uh, Rose or Lashonda in terms of, what was the, the decision making and whether communication was even consulted in that case, or it has been discussed before. But you know, looking it, looking from the outside and not knowing the the result, I I really had the impression that you know probably the communication or the head of um, you know corporate reputation, however you want to call it, was not part of the decision making process. And and I too, uh, you know, outsider's perspective as well. But what what I have read. There also are some suggestions that perhaps the CEO was well aware that what they were going to do was illegal, but the uh, I guess the other alternative was going to be more costly and disastrous for the organization um, anyways. And so um, I, I think I've read uh, some, some quotes from him saying that, yes, uh, perhaps we knew, but this was still the better decision. And so in that case, if you were the comms person, um, I guess you really just had, it's really a personal decision. Like if you feel that this still was, despite knowing that the CEO's kind of strategy was that it's still more costly for us to do it the right way, the legal way than to do it this way, then you would have to hopefully articulate why you think this is a bad decision for the organization, but then also for the professional as well, and then, you know, make your decisions about it. And I haven't really seen anything from a spokesperson. So um, I, I would think that perhaps the CEO is has decided, you know, that I'll not die at the stake, but that I will go ahead and, you know, be out front with this because, you know, this is a bad look, but I feel like it was the best decision for the organization. And, and secondarily, um, as I was reading things, I also think that this is a, a potential PR problem for the regulatory body as well. When you have this CEO that is so explicitly saying, yes, I knew I broke the law or that what we were doing was going to break it, but it still was the best option. And so, you know, is that going to then give more credence or legitimacy 
uh, to other organizations that might face similar dilemmas and, you know, perhaps encourage them to do something similar as well. So I really think it is a potential issue uh, for them as well. When you have the CEO just saying, oh, yes, we knew. And unfortunately, we still had to make the tough decision to break the law and to lay off all those workers. But at the end of the day, we think it was what was best for the company. That That is a dilemma. Yeah. No, that, that it, and I think there's... There's certainly someone leading the business acting with decisiveness, whether for good or for bad. Mm -hmm. But where do you have, we talked earlier, and I think we kind of, we've we all agreed that, that the, uh, the importance of building relationships with stakeholders and making those conversations more fluid. But what about when you need to prompt those senior stakeholders to act with, with decisiveness? What are, you, what are your top tips when you when you come to, to, to stakeholder management. And Christina, I know yeah, what's sure. important here is the kind of organizational setup in this. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, again, I think knowing your support stakeholder, we have discussed about it, it's key. And in my case, uh, knowing that um, many of my stakeholders are really kind of fact-driven, uh, objective, for me, depicting a very strong fact-driven um, picture of the situation, it's very important because they react better to facts. And, uh, you know, I think it also helps me uh, as a first step to really clarify what is the picture and what is the situation. The second point for me is, you know, use, I think we were alluding before to the experience, use example of what happens if you do not act with decisiveness or if you do get it wrong and you know if you get it wrong you can get it very wrong and this is what can happen what is the impact on um, on your business on your bottom line on your reputation and last but not least i think uh coming back to the point of knowing your stakeholders i think sometimes building a coalition of supporter is absolutely critical so if i know that one or two members of you know of, of my colleagues will be supportive of a specific action or supportive of a st specific strategy i would before have the conversation maybe individually um, with them before going and pitching to the whole board because having some you know vocal supporters obviously helps a lot so just all in all facts um, then basically you know showing what can be wrong or what can be uh, the outcome of a certain decision and third build your coalition of supporters that's that's great and Lashonda I know that, that uh, you have some thoughts on this too because I mean we're, we're good at this right we're comms professionals this is this is what we're good at <laughs> the influence piece right and, I, and the thing that I would add I agree with Christina's three points and the only thing that I think I would highlight is that even if you know we do know our room and know that kind of there are more facts that's driven and if think about it more broadly we're still having to tell a story even if we are emphasizing it or supporting it on that fact. And so um, that's what we do. Like you said, Rose, that's exactly what we do. So whether it's the coalition building that Christina also mentioned, or going in the boardroom and showing them kind of when this goes haywire, here's what happens. We're still telling the story and yeah. presenting the story to them. We're just using those cues that we know will resonate with those in the room. And we can't do that if we don't know who's in the room and if we don't have relationships and if we don't understand kind of, you know, what makes their wheels turn and anticipate what they are going to have either opposition or, you know, perhaps um, be, I guess, kind of encumbered with. And so anticipating all of those things and still telling that compelling story using what they're looking for is still very important to do that. Absolutely. And I, I guess we've been talking um, this afternoon about the various balls you have in the air, the influence, the strategy, um, working your way and ducking and diving through the organization. And I guess for anybody who is thinking about, you know, still I think within, within some organizations, corporate comms is properly elevated as a boardroom discipline, in others not so much. 
So what's the one piece of advice you would give anyone in our audience um, to, to kind of elevate comms in the boardroom? One, one thought, uh, when I, in my last role, uh, the last job I was given um, was rather than extending my role as, as head of marketing, I was given the title head of reputation. And nobody else seemed to hear of this um, at the time. When I when I told people, they kind of looked askance. And I now wonder whether that was actually ahead of its time and whether that signals. Um, it's We're not talking about um, just promotion and campaigns. We're actually talking about the reputation of a business. What, what thoughts do you both have on that? So first of all, just a reaction. I think that head of reputation is great. <laughs> Personally, I'd love to have this job title, frankly. <laughs> So I, I, might, I might start. Actually, I have two, two thoughts, um, if I may, instead of one, Rose. The first one is uh, the element of education that Lashonda mentioned before. It, our, our role is quite uh, specialistic in a way, so never get, never get tired in a way to demonstrate the impact that you can have on the business and repeating you know why it is important i know that you know in my so that continuous education and repetition role i think is very important the second element that i think it's uh, very crucial and again i think we have alluded to that before is the fact that i don't think communication professionals should be seen or should act only as expert of communication. I think the role, you know, you earn a seat at the table if you demonstrate that you are capable of independent thinking, if you're demonstrating that you are a wise advisor to the board, if you are able not only to advise on your communication strategy, but on your strategy overall, on the whole ESG agenda, on governments, you know, on plenty of other topics, so that you basically are perceived as you know, a, 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 an holistic and rounded leader. So I think in that way, obviously your experience or in communication is the reason why you have that seat of the table, but it shouldn't be limiting uh, to that. It should be much more broader. And, and I agree with what Christina was saying. You know, if, if a comms person does find themselves in more of that tactician role where it's not really viewed as a strategic management function at all, um, I think that you still have to do similar coalition building and you still have to work and use the skills that you do have and what you know is the right way to do it. And then I think you, it, in little small increments, try to make those one-to-one -one, um, interactions and relationships and then share, you know, how you can contribute beyond those, you know, tactics and more soft skills that I guess in a culture where communications is not at the table, where it would be viewed as what what you do. And so I also think that in those moments where, you know, it hits the fan and people are stressed about what we'll do, those are the moments where if you've still been doing that work and you've still been, you know, thoughtfully, intentionally and strategically thinking about what the organization needs to do, then I think that, you know, room will be made for you because it will be clear in those moments of the contribution that you can make at the table. And if you are able to shine in those moments and you still don't have a seat at the table, then perhaps you have to make the decision of whether or not that's the right place for you to be because clearly they don't value um, what you can bring to the table uh, despite you demonstrating that even. No, that's, that's right. And I think... I think loud and clear this, in this session, this idea of, is, is at least the things that you can control in yourself, make sure that you are thinking beyond comms, that you've kind of learnt those other parts of the business that you can, you can advise and you've got that broader focus. And yeah, beyond that, that's, that's their problem, not yours. Um, I think that's, that's great. We've got a question um, that has come in from um, Maggie Burke, who is, um, Associate Director at the Cult, uh, for Cultural Impact Communications at the Martin Agency. And she's asking, how often should PR agencies conduct crisis comms training and exercises with their clients? Who'd like to take this first? I can start if you want. <laughs> um, I'm sure, Lashonda, you might have a different view from, <laughs> from me, but, but we'll see. Um, in reality, the way in which uh, 
I personally have, I was in agency before, so I, again, I might have had a different view at the time, but uh, being, in, being, in a, being in the company now, um, what we have identified is that we have identified a number of critical roles that uh, should be trained and retrained in a way uh, on crisis management. So what we tend to do is every time there is a new senior leader joining the organization or getting promoted to a certain role or getting moved to a certain role that is, you know, sensible. Basically, this person gets an induction and then we tend to do a refresh about every 15 months, something like that. Um, in some cases, you know, the we are quite um, strict in the way we run a post-mortem of any crisis management and I think it's crucial so I would say that it's not just about training but when you have gone through a crisis because there's no better exercise that you know we're not all also lucky Lashonda like your students who have a prompt to that sometimes you just have to go with the wind and um, I think one of the things that is absolutely critical is really to do a wash up a post-mortem of every crisis and kind of formalize in that in uh, after that crisis so that you know the following time we can we can learn so yeah so uh in terms of um, ju just to summarize i think identify who are the critical people the critical role that need to go to this training and then it's important to refresh but also to crystallize the learning and I agree with that. I don't think there's a magic number for how often it should happen. I would just say regularly versus seldomly or rarely, um, because I think even as we have kind of this really volatile, politicized, polarized environment, um, you know, I think that we have to make sure that those key um, kind of spokespersons for our organizations are on their game. And so we might need to check in with them um, a, a bit more often if we know that they are the ones uh, that we're gonna go to if we do need someone to speak on the organization's behalf. Uh, I definitely agree that as people move and are promoted into new roles, absolutely yes, they need a very intensive uh, training for that and they need to be put in front of the camera and under the limelight and ask those hard questions because they really need to have an accurate depiction of what likely is gonna happen um, when there actually is a crisis um, that is at hand. And so I think regularly and as often as you can, and just, you know, as the comms leader, making sure that your leaders are prepared and that you are trying to anticipate all those tough questions and making sure that they can be as comfortable as possible, if that is even possible in that situation, um, you know, you know, with that. And my students do get simulations. That's what I think Christina was, was referring to where, um, as much as we can, they come to class one day and have no idea what they'll be coming there to do. And they have to, um, you know, look at what the crisis management plan for the organization is and think about whether or not it addresses what that crisis is. And there are also, you know, um, fast break things that happen during that time frame as well. And the one thing that I can control in that kind of uh, simulated environment is time. And you'd be surprised that time really can um, be very realistic in that regard. So yes, definitely simulating tabletop exercises, whatever um, you can do and as regularly as you can, I think is important. I think Lashonda, I don't know if you have noticed the same, but I've actually seen with the time coming back to your point about educating the board members i think after they go through the crisis training and they realize what potentially we are protecting the organization from they also have much more empathy understanding and respect for the work that we do so when it comes to you know that education process i think you know um having them to empathize and to understand what it takes to be to do our job, I think it's also a great way for them to um, appreciate and value more the work that we do every day. Yes, and show them the science behind communicating because 
you know, I think in general, people think we all communicate because we speak with people daily. So, you know, what's so hard about it? Oh, no, you know, there definitely is a science behind it and should be a strategy. So I do think that, as you mentioned, Christina and others are great opportunities to hopefully get them to kind of see the light, if you will, uh, about that. Yeah. Well, I think people just... Um... They, they really don't like the rehearsal, do they? There's all ways of putting off the rehearsal, but actually they're so they're so valuable um, when you get it right, when when uh, the rubber really does hit the road. And I love that idea with your students. It's like every day is a MasterChef final, <laughs> turning mm -hmm. up and just not knowing what they're going to expect, but dealing with it, which is, which is fantastic. We've only got um, a few minutes left, but uh, one more question um, that, we've, uh, that we've had through about your thoughts on the interplay between the PR and the comms and marketing departments within large organizations um, and how sometimes there might be a bit of silo, um, silos going on or tension um, within those. What's, what's been, what are your thoughts on that? And uh, is that something, perhaps Lashonda to kick that off, you, you, tackle, um, you tackle with your, your students or, or that you've experienced? Well, definitely. Uh, I think as an fortunately, when I was in the industry, I was in an organization where there was a lot of synergy between um, those departments. And so um, I was able to see how when that is at play, how helpful it is for the organization to make sure that the organization overall is not communicating mixed messages, whether it's through the advertisement or, you know, news stories that might be coming from the public relations function, um, that, that is so integral. And so uh, I also think that as comms people, like I said earlier, we have a unique role, but I think we have a, a big responsibility too, because I think when a lot of other functional units are, you know, in this kind of silo thinking and don't really have to think a lot about what else is going on outside of their immediate um, areas, communications people, we have to know all of that stuff that's going on and we have to look at it in a much more broad uh, way, I think, than, than most um, units do. And so I think when we're able to do that, but then also take that a step further and intentionally, you know, articulate how these things either are working really well together or they're not, then we also can um, demonstrate that we are value added as well by saying, hey, did you know that this, you know, finance and marketing and these groups are doing this. However, I think it's really important that we consider, you know, the overall perspective for the organization. And so um, I think that we have a, a huge role to play in that and getting away from the silo thinking. Thank you. Christine, yes. do you want to, to take us, take us yeah. through? Yeah, I think, uh, again, I think at IC working, I think we can be um, very complementary with the marketing function. So I think, you know, there is an element of, as you say, Shonda, of holistic thinking, but also there are so many um, elements and approaches that we can learn in a way from a corporate communication perspective, uh, from a marketing colleagues and vice versa, because I think that element of looking at the holistic picture, that element of combining the different elements together, I think is absolutely, uh, absolutely critical. Personally, in my organization, one of the things that I really appreciate uh, and I'm learning, you know, day after day working with my marketing colleagues is really that element of that I alluded at the beginning, you know, measurement, pushing myself to be more scientific and number driven. That is less our strength area, but is more the area of marketing. And I see that on the other side, when there is, um, you know, a level of engagement needed, when there is an element of risk evaluation needed, when there is an element of, you know, uh, sustainability or environmental impact. I know that more and more our, our marketing colleagues, our marketing function are reaching out to us as a corporate communication team to uh, really get our advice and our perspective. Lovely. Well, we're bang on time. And I know, Christine, you've got a, got a train to catch. Thank you both so much. I think so many rich insights. Love this idea of, of, of communications being being bigger, thinking bigger. And I know on my board, um, I'd want both of you in my corner. Um, <laughs> thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone.